Thanks for coming out to honor Poe this afternoon. And just to get us in the spirit, I know the sunny weather outside sort of getting us in the wrong spirit for Poe, but maybe if we can recite the first stanza of the Raven. Does anybody remember that one? Ready? Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary, or many quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. So that's the start of it. It goes on for about a hundred more lines. But now that we're in the Poe mood, that is the Raven Poe's most famous poem, and it created a sensation when he published it. He only got $15 for the poem. He published it anonymously under a pseudonym because he thought it was so bad he didn't want to risk ruining his reputation by putting his name on it. But within a month, it had been reprinted in three other magazines, and it was creating a national craze. Kids would recognize him on the streets, following around going, nevermore, nevermore. He'd flap his arms like a big bird. And he was in demand as a performer and a lecturer, and he would travel the country. And sometimes 2,000 people or more would show up at his readings, all wanting to hear Edgar the Raven Poe deliver his most famous poem. He had a cousin in Baltimore, Virginia Clem, and she and her mother, her widowed mother, had fallen hard times. They needed someone to take them in and take care of them, and Edgar offered to take in Virginia here and her mother and marry his cousin. Now, he was a little bit older than she was. He was 27 years old, and she was 13. But on the marriage bond, he said she was 21. I don't know who would be fooled into thinking a 13-year-old looked like a 21-year-old, but... This is the guy who was fooled. This is the minister who performed the ceremony. <laughs> and they took their honeymoon in this house down in Petersburg, Virginia. And it said they had a nice, happy, normal life. They used to play games together. They liked to plant flowers around their houses. Edgar loved to hear his wife sing, so even when he was very poor and couldn't really afford it, he made sure she had a piano or a harp to play. He loved to hear her make beautiful music. All the while, he's writing stories about ripping out wives' teeth and chopping up wives into little pieces. But what made Poe's first reputation, his first national reputation, was this image of him as the tomahawk man. And the caption here says, with tomahawk upraised for deadly blow, behold our literary Mohawk Poe, sworn tyrant he o'er all who sin in verse, his own the standard damns he all that's worse. And surely not for this shall he be blamed, for worse than his deserves to be damned. So if you write worse than him, then you deserve to be criticized. But he was called the tomahawk man. He was thought of as the worst literary critic in the country. If he didn't like your work, he didn't stop criticizing the work. He made fun of you while he was at it. One of his good reviews in the Southern Literary Messenger starts out by saying, the best thing about this book is the bad paper in which it was printed. And then he finishes up by advising an author to shoot himself. He called Washington Irving the most overrated writer in America. He said James Fenimore Cooper couldn't write, didn't understand plot. But he also was very perceptive, had great things to say about Nathaniel Hawthorne. Did accuse him of plagiarism, but other than that, he said some nice things about him. So he was starting to make himself some enemies. And the more enemies he made, the more annoyed and offended people got, the more they bought the magazine. So the magazine was really starting to take off, and Poe only got fired twice in the process. But they hired him back after the first time because they knew they needed him. But after that, he decided that he was too big for Richmond. He's going to go to New York City. Richmond only had about 15,000 people. New York already had about half a million. And he started shopping around his short stories, wanted to sell some of his short stories. But the publishers kept saying that you need to publish a novel. That's what really people really wanted to read. So he published his only novel. He'd already printed two installments, but it was published in book form here. It's called The Narrative of Author Cor Gordon Pym of Nantucket. And the rest of this whole description is a title. It's a really long title, but it's basically about a sea voyage to the South Seas. They'd only just discovered Antarctica in 1822, and here it was, 1838, and Poe's writing about Antarctica and the strange people that he envisions as living there. <laughs> 
But because Poe wrote the story, there's also some birds devouring human flesh. There's a corpse being thrown over, sea, over the side of the ship. Little Poe-esque details. And we know that one person who read this story about a sea voyage was actually Herman Melville's brother who owned a copy. And we think that it might have been influence on Herman Melville's seafaring stories. So the short stories weren't really selling in book form, but he found he could make $50 by writing an introduction to this book on seashells. And that's what this is. It's just a book on seashells. It turned out to be his best-selling book during his lifetime, his only book to be published in a second edition while he was still alive. And it's got a nice, pretty cover, too. But what was strange that Poe did, he didn't like to do things the way everybody else did them. Usually in textbooks, they started with the most complex organisms and worked their way to the simplest. He started with the simplest organisms and worked his way up to the most complex. And this was before Darwin had published his theories about the evolution of the species. Poe has already started to have these ideas about how maybe forms got more complex over time. A year later, he finally got a collection of his short stories published. As you know, the year before this, he published a book, gotten paid $50. For his own short stories, he got 25 free copies of his own book. The publishers thought it would never sell. Nobody wants this collection of stories of, about strange things. It's called the tales, the grotesque and arabesque. But about this time, he decided he wanted to write something a little bit of a new vein. And that's when he wrote The Murders in the Rue Morgue, the first modern detective story. He had this idea of a hero who would solve crimes using reason and analysis and observation. And, and people just thought he was a genius when this was published. The magazine in which he's published was called Graham's Magazine. In a year's time, the circulation increased from 6,000 copies a month to 40,000. It was the most popular magazine in the country. He was still making a salary of $800 a year. Meanwhile, the owner was making $25,000 a year, so other people were getting rich off of him. But people celebrated him, they praised him as a genius for this novel kind of story. But he said that it really wasn't that impressive that he had unraveled a web that he'd woven for the very purpose of his unweaving it. Another one of his big hits about this time was The Mask of the Red Death. And Poe lived in a time he survived cholera epidemics, actually two cholera epidemics during his lifetime. So he'd seen epidemics. He'd seen this sort of modern-day plagues all around him, and he was writing stories about the things that really scared people of his day. And after this, a new story called The Telltale Heart. And he had some trouble with this one. The first time he tried to get The Telltale Heart published in a magazine, he was turned down. The publisher said it was a little bit too loud for their taste, but if he could furnish them with something a little bit quieter, they might publish it. So he got one of his friends to publish it, paid him $10. And now it's one that's just about everybody reads in school. So he started to achieve some fame and he got an article written about him. And here's the portrait of Poe that was next to the article. And he supplied the biographical information for a little sketch about his life. He started out by lying about his age, saying he was two years younger. Then he says that after he graduated first in his class at the University of Virginia, he took off to Europe and fought in the Greek Wars of Independence, but was captured and sent to St. Petersburg, Russia. From there, he was rescued and went to London. He edited two magazines while he was there, but he wasn't allowed to tell us the names of those just yet. So he's building up this reputation. He's building up these persona about himself. And this is about the time they started calling him the American Byron. After all, Byron had fought in the Greek Wars of Independence, and so had Poe. And then another story comes out. This one was Poe's most popular story during his lifetime. It's one they don't even read a lot in school today. It's called The Gold Bug. And it's first important treasure hunt mystery. And this is about a guy who finds a piece of parchment and he holds the parchment over the flame and it reveals these strange symbols on them. And it's a code, so he decodes the message on the parchment and it leads him to a series of clues that eventually take him to treasure. So basically it's the plot for the movie National Treasure, but Poe did it back in 1843. So Poe started to make a name for himself. New York City hadn't worked out the first time. He'd moved to Philadelphia, been living there for six years. So he was ready to go back to New York again. So here's Poe about 1845. And wouldn't you know, as soon as he gets to New York, there's a big news story about someone who'd crossed the ocean in a hot air balloon. 
And people rushed to buy this paper to find out all about it until Poe revealed it was just another hoax. Now you can see this in his anthology. It's called the balloon hoax. But this is the original illustration. This is the headline for it when it first came to the papers. So Poe introduced himself to New York by making fools out of everybody. And not long after that, there was this amazing medical discovery. This scientist had discovered a way to mesmerize a man at the moment of death to keep his mind alive after his body was dead. That way he could communicate with the dead. And they kept a fellow in this trance state for several weeks after his death. And they would ask him questions, and they would hear this ethereal voice answering them from beyond. And after they kept him in trance for a long time, they finally decided to wake him up from his trance, and the dead man dissolved into a pool of goo, of detestable putrescence, as Poe called it. And this story was so realistic, it actually made it to a medical journal in England. And even after Poe told them it was a hoax, they still believed it was a story. They still believed it was the truth. So he started to make a reputation for himself in New York City. He's starting to finally get himself noticed, but his wife is back home dying. She's contracted tuberculosis. So far, his mother, brother, foster mother, and wife have all had tuberculosis. And his mother and brother both died at the age of 24. And his wife would also die at the age of 24. And at this time, as his wife is nearing the end, he published the poem, The Raven, the one that made him an international superstar, the one that made him in demand as a lecturer and a performer, made, him, made it possible for him to travel and give readings of his works. So at one point, it's the high point of his career and one of the lowest points in his personal life. And as a celebrity, he was being invited to all the best parties. And this lady threw the best parties. Her name was Anna Charlotte Lynch. She threw sort of literary soirees and invited all the famous writers to her house. And Poe would go to her parties every single week. Poe's wife, who at this point was invalid, encouraged Poe to go to these parties because it more or less kept him out of trouble, kept him away from drinking. Because she knew that Poe couldn't handle alcohol. A glass of wine would make him staggering drunk. He'd be sick for days afterwards. So his family encouraged him to do anything that sort of kept him away from alcohol, which was kind of difficult in a time when it was considered rude not to accept someone's alcohol or when it was actually often safer to drink the alcohol than it was to drink the water. But this lady hosted the best parties and Poe would go to these parties every single week, and ladies at these parties kept asking him, can you really mesmerize people? Is that story about mesmerism true? And one of the ladies at the party, Elizabeth Ellett, was a married poet who started singing him love poetry. Another one of the ladies there was Frances Sargent Osgood. They called Fanny Osgood. And she and Poe would exchange flirtatious poetry to each other. And usually try to be a little bit secretive about this, but they would publish it in the major magazines of the day, just use different pseudonyms so they could, one week you would read a poem by one of them, and the next week you would read the next one's poem answering the first ones. It's a very public flirtation, which again, might have been another one of Poe's hoaxes because Francis there on the right was actually a good friend of Poe's wife on the left there. But then a little bit of a scandal rose because that first lady I told you about, Elizabeth Ellett, she had been sending him love poetry and Poe would take this poetry home, even though a married man should never accept love poetry from a married lady, he'd take it home, give it to his wife and her friend Francis, and they'd read it, each, read it to each other and laugh at it. And they were having a good time laughing at Elizabeth Ellett's poetry one day when she caught them laughing at her poetry, she was horrified. Her husband had already separated from her by then, so she sent her brother to Poe's house, and Poe got in a fight with him and naturally challenged him to a duel. But Poe didn't have a pistol to have the duel, so he went to another friend, Thomas Dunn English, to borrow a pistol to have the duel and got in a fight with him too. And he was taken off the guest list of Anna Cheryl Lynch's parties, wasn't allowed to go back to those parties anymore. But there was a little bit of a fallout from the scandal over the letters and the duels, and eventually Poe left New York City and moved to the countryside, to this little cottage in the Bronx, which used to be 14 miles outside New York City. And that's where Poe's wife finally passed away, again, at the age of 24. This is her deathbed portrait. And in those final days of her life, Edgar himself was falling apart. His nurse here, Marie-Louise Shue, 
said that Poe had a regular heartbeat, he had the brain fever, he'd be dead very soon as well. The newspapers were reporting that the famous poet Poe would be dead any day now. But Mrs. Shu here managed to nurse him back to health, and in his appreciation, his gratitude for all she'd done, he wrote some poems for her to MLS, to Marie Louise, and the beloved physician. That last poem, she burned the manuscript because she said it was so personal she didn't want anybody else to ever read it. So we don't know what would have become of these two. They became very close friends, but then her pastor read one of Poe's books and was horrified, commanded her to save her soul. She had to cut off all contact with Poe immediately, so she did. But fortunately, his lecture tour brought him up to Lowell, Massachusetts, and this lady, Annie Richmond, the subject of his poem for Annie, fell in love with her. She was the perfect woman. She was actually, he's about 39 years old. She's closer to his wife's age. She's in her 20s. And he thought she was beautiful and gentle and kind. The only problem is she wouldn't leave her husband and family for him. So his lecture tour brought him to Providence, Rhode Island. He met this woman, Sarah Helen Whitman, who'd been sending him fan mail before they ever met. So as soon as he met her, he took her on a long walk through the cemetery and he proposed her among the tombstones. But her mother heard about it, heard about her associating this scandalous poet Poe and threatened to disinherit her if she didn't call off the engagement. He was so distraught that he attempted suicide. He tried to overdose on a painkiller called laudanum, which was opium mixed with alcohol. He took 60 times normal dose. And he was on his way to the post office to mail a letter to Annie Richmond and collapsed. And Sarah Helen Whitman, the second woman, her friends found him and took him home and took care of him. But this is him four days after that suicide attempt. You can tell he's depressed, he's miserable, he's lost all hope. But here he is 10 days later. Sarah Helen Whitman has agreed to marry him. But she had one condition. She said, if you ever drink again, the wedding's off. That engagement lasted one month. <laughs> but Poe's journeys eventually brought him back to Richmond. This was the home of his childhood. And he was also still in this lecture tour. He stayed here in the Swan Tavern, which wasn't the greatest hotel, but it was respectable for the time. This is an interior shot of the Swan Tavern. His sister still lived in Richmond, this nice house called Duncan Lodge. And her neighbors lived in this house called Talavera. And it was in this house that Poe gave his very last private reading of the Raven. The ladies present gathered in the parlor and he turned down the lights very low and he started reciting the Raven. It was so dramatic that when he got the part, get thee back into the tempest on the nice Plutonian shore, half the people in the room ran and hid. <laughs> also during this trip, he gave his last public reading in this nice hotel, the Exchange Hotel. And one of the people in attendance was his first fiance, Elmira Royster. Now she was Elmira Royster Shelton, a widow. She'd been widowed five years earlier. She'd gone through the appropriate length of mourning, so she was able to accept suitors now. And he visited her house on Church Hill. He came unannounced one day. Back in those days, you had to present a calling card, let people know you were coming. He just shows up. And Almira said she heard a commotion coming from the front porch here. She went downstairs, looked down these steps, and saw Elmira, saw Edgar arguing with one of her servants. And Poe looked up and saw Elmira, and Elmira looked down at him, and he says, Elmira, is that you? And she says, go away, i got to go to church. So he came back again, and he kept coming back again, and eventually in this parlor, they renewed their engagement. They planned to get married on October 17th, and this was the last photograph of him ever taken. This was late September of 1849. He's just become engaged to Elmira. Things are starting to go his way. He'd even written a new poem that he wanted to publish with his wedding announcement in the local papers. But his last night in Richmond, he was very sick. He had a fever. His pulse was racing. Elmira encouraged him to go visit this doctor. This was Dr. John Carter. And Carter had the same advice. You're very sick. You should stay in Richmond. You shouldn't travel. 
It's a couple days journey to Philadelphia. You really should just stay here and recover. And Poe left about midnight and left his walking stick there and took Carter's walking stick with him by mistake. But there's a big difference between Carter's walking stick and this one. This one is just a simple wooden walking stick. Carter had a sword cane, a weapon. Would have been a lot heavier. You'd think he would have noticed a difference. We don't know if maybe he was worried people were following him. We know that earlier that same summer in Philadelphia, he said that people were trying to track him down and kill him and even begged one of his friends to shave off his mustache because he's worried they were trying to kill him. But we don't know if that was real or is that just his imagination. We don't know really what was going on with him those last couple months of his life. This is his trunk of possessions. As he was on his lecture tour, traveling the country, he carried his clothes and notes and books with him in this trunk, and he left it in Richmond at the Swan Tavern where he'd been staying. Then he caught the steamship up to Baltimore. From Baltimore, he's going to catch a train to Philadelphia. But he disappeared for five days. When he was found, he was semi-conscious, dressed in ill-fitting, second-hand clothes, didn't look anything like the kind of clothes he would have worn. He couldn't remember how he'd gotten there, what had happened to him. He was asked if he knew about him in Baltimore. He asked for a magazine editor called Joseph Snodgrass, who took him here to Washington College Hospital, where he spent his last four days. He was delirious. He was in and out of consciousness. He wasn't making any sense. He kept saying he had a wife back in Richmond. He had to get back to his wife. But he actually died 10 days before he would have married Elmira. And that new poem of his, his very last poem that he was going to publish at the wedding announcements, was first published at the end of his obituary instead. It's called Annabelle Lee. And the doctor wasn't sure what was wrong with Poe. The only clue he really gave was on Poe's last night, he woke up and screamed the name Reynolds over and over again, but we don't know who Reynolds was. And finally he calmed down. His last words were, Lord, help my poor soul. He was 40 years old. And this is an engraving that was made shortly after Poe's death, just a few years later. You see, these are the great American writers. You see right in the middle, standing up is James Fenimore Cooper, sitting at the table with his chin rested on his hand, is Washington Irving. And farther over to the left, there's a fellow who's looking the other direction, and kind of looking down. That's Edgar Allan Poe. Sort of the, the position he had in American letters at that time. He was popular, everybody was reading his works, but he wasn't always accepted in the academic community. Here's a guy who's a college dropout who's all of a sudden become a best-selling author. Meanwhile, the respected authors like, well, Poe's big rival, Longfellow, had nice teaching positions. But in France, that's where they really started to accept him as a great poet. And this is, again, Baudelaire, the French poet. Of course, there's Salvador Dali. The Surrealists claim Poe is one of their inspirations. And also the Dadaists, like Marcel Duchamp, who did the picture of Mona Lisa with a mustache or that urinal on the bottom there, claimed that Poe is an inspiration because Poe defined originality as refusing to do what was already done. So Duchamp wanted to do new things that just hadn't been done before, invent new genres, invent new kinds of art like Poe had done. But it's not just visual artists and writers who are inspired by Poe. This is Alfred Hitchcock, did The Birds and Vertigo and Psycho. He said the reason he made the kind of movies he did was because when he was growing up, he used to read Poe's works. But also, another contribution to Poe's was he had this crazy idea that the universe, instead of being static, and instead of looking like it always has, all started from one very dense particle. And there's a big bang and that everything expanded out from one, that one particle. In the 1920s, a Belgian scientist developed this into the Big Bang Theory. And Poe's time, they just thought he was a little bit kooky. And Poe's probably unique amongst 19th century American writers as being the only one who's actually fought crime alongside Batman, as you see on the left, and alongside the Atom, the world's tiniest superhero. So he's been in comic books pretty much since the early days. That's Batman Nevermore, a limited edition comic series. Poe even helped Scooby-Doo solve a crime. You can see him next to Freddy there. And he's been in the movie since the earliest days. The first m movie made about Poe's works was from 1907. But early on, people have been intrigued by his life and what kind of person he was. This is one from the 1940s about Poe's different women friends. 
And even next year, there's going to be one. This is John Cusack as Poe in a movie that's supposed to be released next March called The Raven. So even though Poe's been dead since 1849, he's very much still a part of our culture. And he's everywhere. I mean, comic books, movies, cartoons, music. And I think that's why we're here, and that's why he deserves to be remembered. And he's really an author that helped put American literature on the map. But he's equally at home anywhere in the world that he's read. So he doesn't just belong to Baltimore, or Philadelphia, or New York. He really belongs to the world because the world is the one that's kept him alive. He's somebody that sort of unique in his position as being an international writer. And the president of the Poe Museum is actually a relative of Edgar Allan Poe's. He's a descendant of one of Edgar Allan Poe's uncles. And a few years ago, he went to Germany to do a German game show where they guess your favorite relative. Guess, guess who this person's relative is. And he was on this game show. As soon as he got on there, they asked him, well, are you an American? And he said, yes. And they immediately recognized well, Edgar Allan Poe. He's an American probably more famous around the world than Thomas Jefferson or Benjamin Franklin. He's really the one who helped put American imagination and American literature on the map. 